Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithananda Sihadvaita Gadhadhar Sivasari Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Sri Pancha Tadva Ki So we heard this morning from Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu on verse number one, giving us a overview of the verse and a practical understanding of the uh, importance of application of knowledge. <laughs> Not only to hear it and to understand it, but to apply it. In fact, application comes, understanding comes by application. <laughs> Theory is not enough to give us the realization of the words of the Shastras, the words of the spiritual master. Philosophical knowledge is a direction. It's not an end in itself. In the sense that it points the direction for understanding and for application. So by understanding the knowledge, it's not enough. We have to apply it. And then understanding becomes, uh, what we say, realized. <laughs> there is gyan and there is vigyan. Gyan means philosophical, theoretical knowledge of spiritual principles. Vigyan means that knowledge when it becomes realized. The word is vishishta. V means short for Vishishta. Vishishta means intensification of the theory in practice, which means brings about realization. And as Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu mentioned throughout his lecture, unless we come to that platform, you know, we're really just skimming the surface. We're not really, and we're constantly being afflicted and affected by the miseries of material energy. <laughs> So we have to go into the practical understanding of that knowledge to apply it and to understand how to apply it. <laughs> so this next verse is verse 3. It's not verse 2. Somehow or other, we decided, I don't know how it happened, so we wound up doing verse 3 instead of 2 for next but verse 3 is those things that you must do <laughs> or those things that what is the nature of the application and it also includes the application itself the first three out of the six are the mood of the practice and the next three are more like the things that you practice the things that you actually practice. And so we'll be talking about the do's. And then at four o'clock, Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu will tell you what you shouldn't do. <laughs> usually when we give, usually the, the order is they tell you what you shouldn't do first because that's what we usually do. We're doing what we shouldn't do, so you should hear that first. <laughs> but somehow or other I got bewildered. <laughs> And we wound up doing verse 3 instead of 2. It just worked out. The reason I did that is because I felt he was better at telling you what not to do, and I'm better at telling you what to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if that's correct or not, but that's basically how I understood it. So in order to continue with the rhythm of the... Uh, we juggle it this way. But... I don't think there's too much of a deviation in text by doing hearing about what you should do first. <laughs> and then that'll, of course, that'll minimize his class because then you'll know, <laughs> you'll probably know what not to do when you understand what to do. <laughs> like that. And so I'll read the verse, although it's not on the board, even though I have a, a book, I can't completely understand any of the words in it. Nectar drohovni na pok 
Yaakov. <laughs> I think that's nectar. <laughs> okay. One thing you should not do is read someone else's language. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> it makes it look you look like you don't know what you're doing. Utsahan nishtaya daryat tat tat karma pavartana sangatiaga sado rite sad bir bhakti prasidati. Word for word, please repeat. Utsaha by enthusiasm. Nishtayat by confidence. Daryat by patience, tat tat karma, various activities favorable for devotional service. Pavartanat by performing, sangatyaga by giving up the association of non devotees, sata. Of the great previous acharyas, vrte, by following in the footsteps, sadbi, by these six, bhakti, devotional service, prasidyati, advances or becomes successful. And here's the translation. There are six principles favor for the, favorable for the execution of devotional service. One, being enthusiastic. Two, endeavoring with confidence. Three, being patient. Four, acting according to regulative principles such as hearing, chanting, and remembering Krishna, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smarnam. Five, that was four. Five, abandoning the association of non devotees. Six, following in the footsteps of the previous acharyas. These six principles undoubtedly, undoubtedly assure the complete success of devotional service. So, we'll take them and we'll go through them and we'll discuss them one by one. And, uh, we'll find that actually these things also overlap. I can't see you with my glasses and I can't see this without them, so this is really a tough one. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'll try without the glasses. It's better to see you. <laughs> All right. Enthusiasm. So what is enthusiasm? We hear the word quite often, and people use it quite off, uh, loosely sometimes. Be enthusiastic. So Rupa Goswami gives a definition of enthusiasm. He says, enthusiasm means to endeavor according to scriptural injunctions. And then he gives a side note with intelligence. In other words, perform those activities that are favorable to devotional service, with enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is the nature of the living entity's existence. The soul by nature is enthusiastic to serve Krishna. When the soul comes to the material world, it may just keep its enthusiasm, but it directs it towards material desires, material activities, such as building one's better arrangements in this material world through for friendship, society, and love. Love means family life. <laughs> so those things are enthusiastic for the materialist, and many of them are very good at performing activities to bring about these arrangements. But real enthusiasm is the nature of the soul's relationship with Krishna. It's not sentimental. To be enthusiastic means to be to practically understand the principle of knowledge that and guides one in the activity. It's not simply that one becomes enthusiastic but doesn't direct it in a particular way. Enthusiasm is not necessarily some outward display of energy, you know, like running around as fast as you can. <laughs> 
That may be enthusiasm, but it not necessarily is. It could simply be you're stuck in the mode of passion. <laughs> um, enthusiasm is something that is that one develops an eagerness or an intense desire to perform an activity. <laughs> enthusiasm is, is very important. It, enthusiasm alone is the life of bhakti. And it says it gives life to bhakti. Bhakti is already alive, but the, without enthusiasm, one remains what we say dry, material, mechanical, uh, what we say indifferent. In other words, without enthusiasm, there's no life to bhakti. Although bhakti is alive, we're not coming in contact with the life part of bhakti without the desire, without the enthusiastic nature. <laughs> Enthusiasm is so powerful that it alone can destroy negativity. <laughs> we understand that there are certain activities that destroy certain negativities, like lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, envy, um, like that. But simply by being enthusiastic in one's devotional service, the word crushes. And enthusiasm crushes or helps to destroy these bad qualities. <laughs> yeah, because the enthusiasm is the life of bhakti itself. Now enthusiasm, if it's not there, how do you bring about it? So the acharyas give a little step-by-step process, if you're not enthusiastic about devotional service, then perform some activity and offer results to Krishna in devotion. In other words, karma yoga. Karma yoga means um, I'm doing something for Krishna. I'm doing something that I like, and I, but I'll do, I'll give the results to Krishna. Some money, some time, some energy, some talent, and perform some service. It helps one to get free from the desire of selfishness, which is the basic principle of material life. Material life is basically selfish because everyone is self-centered, everyone is looking for their own. So karma yoga is a step out of the, the, the box of selfishness because it allows you to do something for the Lord and give some results of that. But unless one moves ahead of that, then one will not actually come to bhakti. Karma is supposed to lead one to the process of renunciation of material activities because by giving up the fruits of one's activities, one starts to understand that uh, material activities are not the source of happiness. But unless one comes to the process of bhakti, one remains indifferent. <laughs> so karma yoga cannot satisfy one. It can only get you from zero to step one. <laughs> and we see that, you know, a lot of times people come to our society, they do something, they give some donation, they offer some prayer, they, they leave the temple, or they may do something and then go away. They're doing something. There's some credit there. Obviously, they're getting some mercy. But it's not bhakti itself, because it's, it's still, it's for me, and I'm offering something to the Lord, I get a little detached from my own selfish gain, that's all. But in, if one continues in the process of karma yoga and develops karma yoga more intensely, then what happens is that one becomes completely indifferent to material activities. But still, one doesn't come to the platform of bhakti, therefore what remains is indifference. <laughs> And in that platform, one cannot function, one cannot move forward. So one has to, again, move forward to the process of bhakti. So karma yoga is based on you know, indifference to material activities. Jnana yoga is also based on indifference to material activities, but at the same time, philosophical cultivation of knowledge in order to gain spiritual understanding like that but no devotional activities. These are the jnanis, the yogis, the impersonalists, the mayavadis. They are on the platform of jnana, study the shastras. They don't do any service. Bhakti 
is characterized by one main quality that these other two qualities don't have, faith. <laughs> we heard about faith this morning. Faith is the fundamental principle that brings bhakti about and moves bhakti through the different stages to the highest stage. Faith. Hmm. So, faith arises uh, from association. So faith arises from this cultivation of transcendental knowledge. One starts to develop faith. Now, when bhakti is not fixed, when faith is still pliable or malleable or what we say very tender, one performance of bhakti will be interrupted by various types of anarthas. And what are those anarthas? Of course, we, there are 16 anarthas, but there are certain principal characteristics of these anarthas that block our continuation of bhakti. One is false confidence. <laughs> the idea that, you know, I can do it. <laughs> That's, it looks like enthusiasm, but it's not. <laughs> it's a false sense of enthusiasm that comes with the same material conception that I am the, in the enjoyer, I am the controller. <laughs> we can't do anything. All we can do is put ourselves under the guidance of Shastra, Guru, Sadhu, Krishna, and work accordingly. And then we become empowered to do things when we become empowered to develop more and more faith in our practice. So this false confidence comes by simply uh, thinking that I am the doer. And therefore, what results? Sporadic endeavor. When things don't go according to my way, or situations look differently, I lose my enthusiasm like that. On again, off again, back and forth. What it causes? Indecisions. We see the association of devotees, we see the deities, we see everything in a mundane way. Rather than seeing the devotees as being part and parcel of Krishna, who have become to the shelter of Krishna, and who are actually our greatest friends, because they help us in the process of devotional service, we see them externally by the body, or by the type of personality they may exhibit or character like that. And that cause, uh, causes us to become what we say indecisive or flickering in our execution of devotional service. We see the deities, but the deity is Krishna. Arche, Vishnu, Siladi, Gurushu, Normati, Vaishnava, Jatiputi. The deity is not simply made out of some material elements. The, the Lord enters into the material elements and becomes the deity, and that deity becomes worshipable as the Lord himself. There's no difference. Because the material energies are created by Krishna himself. So his, that energy, he can become the energy and at the same time maintain himself as the source of the energy. So therefore, and the deity is God. So when we look at the deity, do we see God or do we see just some nice decoration up there? <laughs> so that's because our consciousness is not purified yet. We lack the spiritual enthusiasm to move forward and therefore apply the transcendental knowledge to our practice like that. We struggle with the senses. We want to be enthusiastic in devotional service. We heard this morning first verse was nicely emphasized how important it is to control the mind and the senses. Mm. In fact, Srila Prabhupada and I think Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu mentioned, you know, Prabhupada says, without controlling in the mind and the senses, there is no advancement in Krishna consciousness. Zero. Not a little, no. One has to practice mind control. And mind control is fortified by two things, detachment from the temporary, attachment to the eternal. As long as there is attachment to both, or you know, you're dividing your attachment, the mind can never be controlled because it's always going back and forth. I think 
Buddha Bhavana Prabhu quoted uh, uh, Sachi Nandana Maharaj this morning in his lecture in, in London, wasn't it about two months ago, or about a month ago, right? When he came to London, he said that, you know, the problem, we get brain damage because we don't listen to the super soul. <laughs> Therefore, we can't control the mind because we're, the mind is controlling us. <laughs> to control the mind means to put the mind under the spiritual energy. And as was mentioned, the mind is in the mode of goodness. So the mind is by nature translucent. It's like a clear, beautiful pond that reflects the nature of the soul. Soon as it gets agitated by the material activities, that clear mind gets clouded, and therefore it's never peaceful, <laughs> never peaceful, or never can process real knowledge due to its attraction to the material energy like that. Material energy, you have to understand the nature of material energy, it's always changing. So whatever attraction you have to something, will it change according to that, the changing of the, uh, the ever-changing material energy. So that's why nobody's ever peaceful, because their minds are just jumping from one situation to the other, never finding peace. Therefore, the, the, the materialists find peace. How do they find peace? They call it sleep. <laughs> I, I need, you know, when they sleep, they, their wife sees the husband, oh, he looks so peaceful, finally. You know? <laughs> All day he looks like, you know, Harani Kashi Poop, but now he's... <laughs> He looks, he's getting closer to Prahlad, but not quite. <laughs> the point is that, you know, that because their minds are always giving them trouble, they're never peaceful, and therefore they're, they're never happy. <laughs> but a devotee knows that, as was saying, put the application of the principles. We have to learn how to apply them. So the first thing is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is the life of bhakti. One can make sufficient progress simply becoming enthusiastic. Enthusiasm is so fundamental to anything we do in devotional service. What is the ap opposite? Apathy. Indifference. Laxadaisicalness. Mundaneness. Routineness. It all somehow or other destroys our, our ability to taste the happiness in Krishna consciousness. So when we see the activities we perform as, as, as ordinary activities, like someone says, well, you know, why don't you wash the pots? All right, I'm washing pots. But you're washing Krishna's pots. And as you clean the dirt from the pot, you're cleaning the dirt from your heart. The same way, Whatever activity we're doing, it's not material. Although it looks, as they say, the karmi yogis and the bhakti yogis, and even the karmis, in a sense, the activities are the same. The only difference is the consciousness behind the activity. One knows I'm doing it for Krishna. The other one is I'm doing it for myself. I'm, and if I like the activities, or if I'm doing it because I'm getting some money from the activities, then I continue. But a devotee doesn't, he doesn't care what the activity is because it's for Krishna. He does it with enthusiasm, he does it with intelligence, he does it in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just to get it done. Mm -hmm. So this destroys the tendency to become apathetic or indifference. Bhaktivinoda Kaur talks about these, prince, these negative principles in relationship to our japa. Right, every day we got to chant japa. Right, okay. Tomorrow you're going to start with 16 again. Okay, you know that, right? <laughs> it's 16 every day, <laughs> it's, it goes from zero. <laughs> and you might think, oh, I did 16, yeah, I got to do 16 today. Tomorrow's another day of 16. In other words, we start thinking in terms of, you know, the activity has to get done somehow. And that destroys the quality of the activity. And it, it blocks Krishna's mercy. So that wherever there's apathy, apathy or indifference towards any activity, 
then enthusiasm is not there. <laughs> and one doesn't get any, hardly any results from it. Enthusiasm, again, you have to understand one thing, intelligently applied. So the Shastras, they tell, talk us in terms of the chanting of the holy name, there's a way to chant. There's a way to approach Krishna's holy name. There's a way, there's a mood for which one can access the mercy of the Lord in the form of chanting. So by applying these things, you're activating your intelligence in, and applying it in the activity, and that stimulates the enthusiasm. Right? Not just routinely going through the, the motions like that. That's the difference. So one has to see, you know, it's just the tendency of the conditioned soul to like certain activities and not like others, right? Or to like one more, one type of activity more than others. <laughs> but in devotional service, everything is absolute. Of course, there's another principle there, and that is engaging according to nature. Because when you're engaged according to your, what we say, swadharma, swadharma means your material nature, then you may be enthusiastic and then you apply that to Krishna consciousness and you make nice advancement like that. So that's also recommended. But in general, any activity we perform should be, uh, we apply the intelligence just like we hear. We go to a kirtan mela. We hear either Madhava or Sachi Nandana Maharaj say, sing for your heart, sing loudly. Listen to the other devotees sing while you're singing. Sing with concentration. Visualize the words in your mind as you're singing the words. See, these are all ways to apply the principle of enthusiasm to the activity and get what we say, move the consciousness away from the mode of what we say, passion. Passion is the mode of getting results into the mode of goodness. The goodness means to do the activity simply for the pleasure of the person you're doing the activity for. And then, of course, that leads to transcendence like that. So enthusiasm is life. Without enthusiasm, we are dead. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, I'll read one verse. Let me see here. I got more notes than I got space here. It's too much enthusiasm. <laughs> There's one verse. Okay. It's from the 11th canto, verses 20 to 27. Here. Having awakened faith in the narrations of my glories, Krishna speaking. This, if you understand this verse, you'll never get discouraged in devotional service. Having awakened faith in the narrations of my glories, being disgusted with all material activities, I'm tired of Maya, knowing that all sense gratification lives, leads to misery. Okay, we, we're, we got some attraction to hear the glories of the Lord. We're tired of material activities. We understand that material activities leads to suffering. But still being unable to renounce all sense enjoyment Still, although those things are there, we still can't give it up. So what does Krishna say? He says, no, he doesn't say that. <laughs> he says, he gives you some hope. He says, my devotees should remain happy and worship me with great faith and conviction. Even though he sometimes engages in sense enjoyment, my devotee knows that all sense enjoyment leads to a miserable result and he sincerely repents such activities. Okay, so this is in principle of enthusiasm, because even though we're aware of the pitfalls and the uh, what we say the sufferings caused by material activity, we're not we because of that tendency is still there in our conditioned nature. We can't give it up, but we should never get discouraged. We see that sometimes devotees. They keep trying and trying, and they keep failing, and then after a while they say, I quit. I can't give it up. Let me take a lesser plat platform, and I'll just somehow 
you know, perform. I'll just go on Sunday for the Sunday feast because that I can get into that. <laughs> no. So that's the point is never to become discouraged because Krishna, actually Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in this purport writes a beautiful prayer in relationship to how a devotee should worship the Lord in this mood, praying that I'm so fallen. I'm so unqualified, but yet your mercy is, is greater than any disqualification that I have. And therefore, through that prayer, one develops great hope. And with that great hope, there is great opportunities for advancement like that. Don't ever lose hope <laughs> because of circumstances. Circumstances are placed in our life just to help us move from one situation to another. They're never obstacles if we, do, if we allow them simply to be opportunities for our, our advancement. So Krishna gives assurance. Don't be, he says, Krishna says, remain happy. Simply remain happy and worship me with faith and conviction, like that. And that, that gives us assurance. <laughs> Okay, so that's a little bit about enthusiasm, like that, and uh, good sadhana, following guru and shastra, develop nice relationships with other devotees, and then one comes to the platform of ruchi. Ruchi means steady. Steady means it doesn't matter what's happening, whether it goes right or wrong, I'm fixed, like that. Okay. If we see, oh, we see difficulties, obstacles, you know, setbacks as the way to lose our enthusiasm as opposed to the way to gain our enthusiasm, right? Then we are lost. <laughs> We're lost. So one should never be discouraged and always remain enthusiasm. Enthusiastic comes from association of devotees and understanding philosophical principles and applying them in the proper way. Any questions on enthusiasm before we move to the next one? Yes. Wrong association. Wrong association weaken, not only weakens, it could actually destroy it. <laughs> Good association brings it up, wrong association, or even the lack of association causes us to not move forward or weaken our enthusiasm, whatever is there like that. That's why it says, you know, sadhu sangha, sadhu sangha, sarva sastri hoi, lava matta, sadhu sangha, sarva siddhi hoi. One moment association with a great soul, one moment, the word is lava matta. Lava matta means one eleventh of a second. <laughs> That's the actual translation of lava matta. You divide a second into eleven parts. That's a lava matta. That much association with a pure devotee, and you can destroy all of your reactions to all sinful activities immediately. That's how fast. So association is what is needed as the main ingredient to develop the enthusiasm as we apply the teachings in our day-to-day -day practice. Mm -hmm. And of course, the more advanced the association is, then. see here it also mentions that, and this is actually part of this verse, is that because of certain material tendencies, we lose our enthusiasm. And therefore, we know that. So what should we do? Just associate. Just like you come to this, just by coming here and hearing the classes and simply trying to absorb what you hear, you're making advancement. Your enthusiasm is actually being fortified or nourished like that. That's how powerful the devotee association is. And the more advanced the association, the greater the advancement like that, the greater the enthusiasm. 
if somebody says one thing that hits something in our our mind that something really sparks our intelligence that alone is a great gain right one thing one thing you take away with you and you apply it in your life that's a great gain so that's so important enthusiasm anything else on enthusiasm the life of bhakti yes uh, chandrika Nishta. Yes. Nishta means steady. Oh, so that means that the mind is in such a control that you can develop this Nishta and Yeah, and ba Buddha Bhavada mentioned that this morning because his verse was very much focused on, on training the mind to become a Goswami. And that's Prabhupada's purport or preface to this text that the mind can control the other pushings, the desire to speak unnecessarily, the desire for anger, or the flare-up of anger, tongue, belly, and genitals. When the mind is fixed on higher knowledge, then you can control these things easily. So everything kind of centers around taking dictations from the mind that is gauged according to the intelligence. And intelligence is actually the super soul, like that. Or Shastra, like that. Heart and mind are similar synonymous to each other in terms of meaning. The heart is the, is the composite or the reservoir of where are all our emotions and desires are sitting. The mind is an expression of that. Like that. So just like it says Cheto, Darpana, Marginum. So the Acharyas give two different uh, translations to that. Cleansing the mirror of the mind, cleansing the mirror of the heart. Both translations are accepted as, you know, bona fide. So the heart and mind is not much difference. <laughs> We're talking about this, you know, the real mind, not the material mind. <laughs> material mind is always it's the formulation of certain certain conceptions that we add on to our spiritual mind. It covers our spiritual mind. <laughs> we think I'm this body, right? He was mentioning it this morning. We hear over and over, I'm not this body, I'm not this body, I'm not this body, but still we maintain the idea that I'm, I'm this body. That means there's a covering over the pure mind, and that covering is strong and makes us think in the wrong way. <laughs> That's all. What is that covering? Attachment to the temporary. <laughs> like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes, uh, Savirchi? Yeah, there's enthusiasm in the mode of goodness, enthusiasm in the mode of passion, enthusiasm in the mode of ignorance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Enthusiasm in the mode of goodness is, you know, to be, uh, to endeavor for things that are, you know, r r pious activities, you know, acquiring knowledge, being a very charitable person. Enthusiasm in the mode of passion is, you know, to work hard for material gain, material things. Enthusiasm in the mode of ignorance is enthusiastic for sinful activities, intoxication, illicit sex, like that. <laughs> so, yeah, the modes uh, reflect the different qualities in different ways, that's all. And But enthusiasm for transcendence is enthusiasm for the service of the Lord. As <laughs> soon as you lose your enthusiasm, you're dead. <laughs> so one, and if you say, well, how do I get enthusiasm? Well, the next one, 
confidence. Mm -hmm. The next principle is confidence. Confidence comes by understanding Shastra. We'll read a little bit. The determination that, which is unbreakable, which is sustained with steadfast in yoga, and thus controls the activities in the mind and the senses, is, the, is confidence or determination in the mode of goodness. So one remains unbreakable, and therefore. Therefore, how to, to come to that point of unbreakableness? So the Shastras are, have different ways to approach them. You can approach Shastra through Prayaksha. Prayaksha it means, uh, you know, there are Shastras that teach us based on empiric and philosophical knowledge. Upamana means analogies. Anumanta means history, right? Anumanta is the history, I think. I'm not sure. I'd have to refer to my other section of notes here. <laughs> Too many notes. Got more notes than I can note. <laughs> anyway. <sighs> mad professor, huh? Maybe just mad. Okay. Okay, I'll give you the understanding of these three here. Hare Krishna. It's one of those days. <laughs> Let's see. Anuman. Anuman, hypothetical understanding. Upaman, analogies. Prayaksha, direct understanding. So Shastras deal, deal with all those. But if you take knowledge from these acts, sections of the Shastras, you don't develop determination or confidence. You have to go to Sabda. Sabda means transcendental sound vibrations. Mm -hmm. So therefore, Vaishnav scriptures are those scriptures that are coming from the present Acharyas mm -hmm. in our line, are that knowledge that we should, you know, accept and nothing else like that. Okay, and then there's ten principles of transcendental knowledge which helps to develop confidence. They're called the ten subject matters. And I'll read those ten. Now, there is another thing called amnaya. Amnaya means you have to hear this knowledge through Guru. Amnaya is that knowledge transmitted by Guru. You can't somehow or other simply approach Shastra directly. You have to approach Shastra through Guru. Because Shastras, uh, what is that verse? Tarko Pratishta Shutinam Bibinam. What's the next line? Aiva. Mahajano yena katasapanta is the last line. That means that the different acharyas, different philosophers, different munis will give different understandings of the same knowledge. But how do you get it? Mahajano yena katasapanta. You have to follow in the footsteps of the great souls who have realized the shastras, and they come in the line of disciplic succession like that. So that's Amnaya. Now Amnaya, realities come. There are nine realities and one, what we say, Asraya, or one, what we say, uh, uh, one principle. The pr main principle is Sri Hari is the only worshipful Lord. Brahman, realization, Paramatma, realization are subordinate. And then the nine principles, I'll just read them. Sri Hari is naturally full of inconceivable potencies. Sri Hari is full of spiritual ras. The living entities are minute particles of Krishna, and they're innumerable. Two kinds, there's the conditioned souls and the liberated souls. <coughs> living entities are searching for happiness, but yet they find, they look for happiness in the wrong place. Krishna and everything else is connected by the principle of simultaneously one and different. We'll go back over them. Krishna is everywhere, all-pervading. 
Material nature is a transfer of energy. Raganuga bhakti, prema is the goal like that. So these are the ten principles of knowledge and one has to hear these subject matters through amnaya or through the principle of parampara, especially in our case, Shuddha Prabhupada, like that. So when one has a working understanding of these knowledge, then one develops confidence. Confidence. Confidence comes through spiritual knowledge, like that. Like that. Right. If you, if someone, there's three kinds of faith. It's mentioned in the uh, Bhagavad Gita. That faith that is very soft and pliable, and if one runs into a situation or someone who has better argumentative abilities and is speaking against what you believe, you'll lose your faith. <laughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu warned us about wrong association and how by hearing from those who are not qualified to hear, our faith can be destroyed. Faith on the second class platform is you have faith and you're fixed in the process of transcendental understanding, but you may not be able to convince others in each and every situation. <laughs> But you won't be unconvinced yourself. Jai Panchatatva Ki Jai. And then the last one is that those who are fixed in the highest form of faith, they cannot be defeated by anyone and they can present all arguments in opposing, you know, opposing. Their faith is fixed and they can destroy and defeat all opposing arguments. So we have to see. If we're on the lowest platform, then we have to strengthen our faith through hearing and through association, especially hearing from Shastra. And those Shastras are Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and Srimad Bhagavad Gita. These are the three things we should hear regularly, especially these three, like that. Okay, so confidence. I'll read some more about confidence. Now Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that, you know, uh, those who, who doubt the revealed scriptures never attain happiness neither in this world or in the next. Uh, the ignorant and faithless persons who would doubt the revealed scriptures, they fall down. So therefore, if, you're, if one is afflicted by ignorance and he has to get knowledge, if he's... Uh, faithless, he has to get knowledge, but if he continues to maintain doubt, he eventually falls down. That's why it says that the greatest block in our spiritual life is doubt. <laughs> doubting the Shastras, doubting the Lord, doubting the spiritual master, or even doubting our ability to become successful in the process of Krishna consciousness. If you think, I can't do it, other people are more qualified, then what you're saying is that you think you're limiting Krishna and you're limiting the process of devotional service. As um, Bhutta Bhavana Prabhu pointed out so nicely, the problem lies with you. <laughs> it's not with the Shastras, it's not with the Guru, it's not with the process. It's not within, it's with you. So then the question is how to get over that doubt. And therefore, uh, through association and constant hearing. So one of the ways is, even if you're full of doubts, just sit down with faithful persons and keep hearing. Just jam the brain with as much transcendental knowledge as you can. When you can, and then when you get so absorbed and saturated with it, something will change. <laughs> Something will get changed like that. So a little intensification. This is like we have, we have japa uh, retreats, we have kirtan melas to intensify our uh, attraction and our enthusiasm for chanting the holy name and our, the happiness that comes by way of that kind of association. But we can also do concentrated spiritual philosophical seminars that's what we're doing this time we're getting into the philosophy <laughs> i'm 
because the philosophy is a form of realization. When you practice hearing enough, you'll get realization. Buddha Bhavana was making the point this morning that we have to continually process what we hear. Not just hear, but think about what you hear. How does it relate to me? Or something about it that we can see it from, a, from our own perspective, perspective like that. So through concentrated hearing, one develops two things. And this is in the Padma Purana. One starts to get questions, and the second, the other one is to get realizations. So if you're not getting questions or realizations, that means you're not hearing properly. Haribo. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, we have to concentrate on the hearing process, and we'll get some realizations. Oh, yes. I like that. Or we got, oh, maybe I don't understand it, so you raise your hand like that. So both of these things are results of concentrated hearing like that. And these inspire us to move forward. That's why the whole process of Srimad Bhagavatam is Sutta Goswami is elected to speak to 88,000 sages. That's how many people were, were assembled at Nami Sharina. 88,000 sages. And uh, Sonika Rish, you know, was it Sonika? Yeah, Sonika was the spokesman for the sages asking the questions, and Sutta Goswami was the qualified speaker to give the answers. And that went on for 1,000 years. <laughs> We're only doing it for two days. <laughs> so, so they got absorbed. <laughs> because, but they also had a mission because they were concerned about the future of the world and how to come up with those religious principles that would be applicable in the age of Kali. So they had a big task. Not only to hear the knowledge, but to come up with a practical way to give that knowledge in the age of Kali. And so that's how Bhagavatam begins, like that. So this is this. No. So we have to practice the process of absorbing this transcendental knowledge more and more and more. <laughs> when you know the knowledge, you're fixed. Like that. No one can deviate you. Like that. Okay, and these are the nine or ten principles that make up the process of transcendental knowledge. And then I'll read a couple of verses, and this is this is still on confidence now. Uh, let's see. Here, a sincere student should not neglect the discussions of philosophical conclusions, considering them controversial. For such discussions strengthen the mind, thus one's mind becomes attached to Krishna. So philosophical discussions actually strengthen both the intelligence and the mind. Buddha Nabhavana Prabhu was using himself as an example this morning how he wants to know everything. <laughs> so, and Prabhupada said, we should try to know as much as we can about Krishna like that. And we're not satisfied by what we have. We want to know more. <laughs> so, and then, you know, the, there's other verses that talk about, you know, the importance of hearing about Krishna, hearing about Krishna's pastimes in Sri Vrindavan like that. This strengthens the mind and brings about a sense of stronger confidence. And with that way, when we meet obstacles, we're not deterred because we're fixed in knowledge like that. Mm -hmm. If we see things according as was mentioned this morning, we see things the way we look at them, you're not actually seeing the reality. There's always something more to what you see because what you see and what you experience is simply processed by your conditioned mind. And therefore, one conditioned mind is processing differently than another conditioned mind in the same thing. Right? We see that many times. Oh, I like this. Another person says, I don't know, how can you like that? <laughs> oh, she's beautiful. What are you kidding? You know? <laughs> 
He, he's qualified. No, he's just a bum. <laughs> so, you know, everyone sees the same thing, slightly different or even greatly different. This is just the nature of the conditioned mind. So, therefore, one has to be Shastra Chakshus. See through Scripture. And see, as the Acharyas give us a vision to understand things on a, on a higher level. They give us visions for the mode of each of the modes, and then they give us the transcendental vision. What is the actual transcendental vision? And Krishna says, the actual transcendental vision he mentions in the Bhagavad Gita 435, he says that truth is understood when you see me and all living entities in me as my parts and parcels. He says that is transcendental vision. When you see all living beings as part of Krishna and you see Krishna within everything. That's transcendental vision. So we have to we have a little bit to work on, right? <laughs> we have a little bit to work on. So that's knowledge. So that knowledge will free you from what we say wrong decisions, wrong choices, and what we say falling into the pitfall of material activities that cause us distress like that. I think our biggest problem is, and this is the nature of Kali Yuga, we're attached to the results, right? That's our problem, right? We just want results from what we do. And everyone in the material world is like that, right? No one will do anything without some consideration of what gain I'm going to get from this activity. But a devotee knows, or a devotee understands that Spiritual activities is not about personal gain. It's about serving the Supreme or serving the Lord's devotee. Gain comes through the process of service and not simply by some external, you know, results. There may be external results. As Prabhupada, we were talking last night about, I think Janaki Nath was mentioning how if you go out and you do something and you fail, it doesn't matter because you tried and the trying is the success and not, not the results. You may go out and just try to distribute books and you're out there the whole day and you don't distribute one book, but you tried. Krishna says, well done, <laughs> well done, you tried. And that's the whole thing. That's the difference between material results and spiritual results. The devotee tries their best in order to serve the Lord like that. And if something wonderful comes by way of that endeavor, then the devotee gives credit to Krishna. Well, the devotee gives credit to, to Krishna's devotees like that. So in that way we remain detached from you know, personal gain, because personal gain simply fortifies the idea that I am the doer like that. Okay, confidence. Anything, any, any comments on confidence? Yes. You should try for results, but you should not be attached to them, right? We want, we want to build a nice temple for Krishna, so we try. But if we know if Krishna doesn't want it or doesn't make the arrangements for us to have, make it happen, it won't happen. But if the spiritual master says, this is what you should do, then you've been blessed with the results already because he empowers you to do it <laughs> simply by his guidance and direction. How do you know it's the right way? Is that your question? Yes, when something happens that you think, oh, is this right way or that is right way? 
Well, we talked about that in an, in an, I think I mentioned it last night, Buddha Baba, I mentioned this morning. If you're getting an instruction and you're doing it, and you're trying, and something goes wrong, it's still the right way. But if you act independently, and you decide to do something without getting the blessings and guidance and then permission, then you're on your own. <laughs> then when something goes wrong, you don't know whether it's, it's supposed to go wrong or because you acted independently it went wrong. <laughs> How do you know? So the thing is, this is, this is the disease of Kali Yuga. Nobody wants to listen to anybody. <laughs> Right? Nobody wants to listen to anybody. And I'll listen to you if I like what you say. <laughs> but that's the problem. That's the problem. Everyone wants to be their own man, right? <laughs> and that's the problem. So taking guidance doesn't mean I ask for guidance and if I like it, I take it. <laughs> No, it means if you ask for guidance, you take it, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> but Maharaj, you don't understand. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> because by taking guidance, we're actually connecting to Krishna through those persons who give guidance. It's not the person who's giving it. He's acting as simply as an instrument. And then we accept, we're actually accepting Krishna through that. And even if something goes wrong, still you're in the best position because you followed the instructions. I'm not sure I heard. Did you did you hear what she said? A physical accident. Well, you have to use your intelligence. Mm, that requires some intelligence. Um, you know, a person may risk their health to do something, another person may not risk their health to do something. So, you might see. Both may be right. Depends on the person, depends on the situation. Mm. Prabhupada, you know, he, he had the instructions of his spiritual master. He didn't put his health as a consideration, although he tried to take care of it, still it failed on him many times. Mm -hmm. Two heart attacks on the boat, a third heart attack after two years of being in America, three heart attacks. And even in 1977, I'm listening to these lectures now, Prabhupada's talking to his devotees, and he can barely talk. His voice is so weak. and. He's overwhelmed with, you know, sickness. But still, he's going on. <laughs> because he knows that the body is temporary and but spiritual life is eternal. And he's fixed. He's not worried about the body so much. He takes care of the body, but you can only take care of the body so much. <laughs> if you make your whole life taking care of the body, that's what you'll get, another body to take care of. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. And another one after that. <laughs> so, take care of the body for your service, <laughs> but not independently. <laughs> and there's sometimes you just have to say no to the body and just do your service. And it happens sometimes. Okay. Confidence anymore? Yes, Buddha Bhavana. Um, can you explain to or help us to understand more about the difference between confidence and self esteem or affidence? How does that work for the devotees? 
Is there such a thing for devotee? Self-esteem? Mm -hmm. Well, self-esteem has a certain connotation to the words. It more or less means that, you know, I'm in control, or actually I'm the doer, or I, I actually did it. <laughs> Uh, one renegs or relinquishes oneself to the higher self, knowing that the real self is the soul and not simply the body or the mind to the intelligence. <laughs> Prabhupada said, real ego means that I am Krishna's part and parcel. I am servant of Krishna. He says, you can be proud of that, that I'm servant of Krishna. It's a kind of a pride that is permissible because it's actually your real identity. <laughs> but pride that comes by way of activity is material because you are taking credit for something that uh, we are only one-fifth of the activity. Bhagavad Gita explains that in every activity five factors of action are present. The, the, the jiva, the endeavor, the time, place, the enthusiasm, I think. And that's the endeavor. Uh, one more. And the last one is the super soul. So everything you do, you should know that there's four other ingredients that are f making you, helping you do what you're doing. Or there are factors that are influencing your activities. So if you want to take credit, take 20%. <laughs> no, that's not really bona fide. But, but the point is, the fact is, even the inspiration to do something, that, that doesn't necessarily come from you. <laughs> it may come from outside. So your inspiration, you have to give credit to that. That what gives you inspiration also. Yeah. Yeah, and there's both. Yeah, Prabhupada, Prabhupada uses the word confidence, but determination is also mentioned. You can't be determined without being confident. Determination is that the feature of the will that fixes one's mind on a particular goal and is not swayed by, you know, success or failure. Confidence is that which supports that activity. And therefore, without the confidence, the determination will never manifest. Uh, confidence is almost more like a, a subtle thing. Determination is more the subtle, impractical activity. <laughs> like that. So, what... What waters down determination is material sense gratification. Every time the living entity jumps and tries to get a little relief from the, from the fire of bhakti, <laughs> I'm in the fire, I need a little break, a little sense gratification, then you water down your determination like that. And Prabhupada says the greatest thing to water down determination is sex, sex, sex activity, sex desire. As soon as you give up sex desire, you can become determined. That's the feature of real determination, is gradually minimizing sex desire until you can destroy it completely, your determinations will be invincible. So, you see, you know, the yogis who have conquered over that, they can do great things, but of course they're doing it in a particular mindset. But the point is that Sex desire is the greatest obstacle to determination. <laughs> so control it through higher knowledge. Control sex desire through higher knowledge and don't act on it. That's all. Don't act on it. See it for what it is and just reject it and act on, on, on devotional activities. That's all. So yeah, that's the greatest stumbling block in Krishna. In determination is, you know, we we somehow or other get caught up in that, you know, 
desire for sexual activity or or even in even even in the subtle forms of sexual activity thinking about it the thinking about it also will cause the mind to become unhappy <laughs> Like that. Okay, so the determination, confidence, pretty much the same. Any other questions? On should we take a little break? Do you need a break because we got another hour to go yet? You want a five-minute break for gayatri? Yeah. Okay, a gayatri break for those who are gayatris, and those of you who are not gayatris, you can just. Hang around with the, the trees. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so it's fa it's one. What is it? Twelve forty-five now. Twelve forty-five. Yeah. So we'll come back at twelve fifty. Okay, five minutes. Don't go too far away. <laughs> What did you just realize? <laughs> That's in Bhakti Loka. That's in Bhakti Loka. Yeah. And Bhakti Vinotakor really hammers that point through. And he makes the. He mentions the. His. Uh, Like in um, in Prajalpa, he mentions eight kinds of Prajalpa, <laughs> different kinds of Prajalpa. So I mean, it gets into the real subtle aspects. We didn't do patience yet, did we? Yeah. No. I have to go a little faster now. I only got an hour left.
Okay. So we can begin again. We'll go to about quarter to two, and then uh, it'll be lunchtime. And we have uh, patience is the next one. The importance of patience. So enthusiasm, determination, patience. Mm -hmm. And so Bhaktivinoda Akur makes a very all-encompassing statement where he says, by patience one controls himself and the whole world. <laughs> by patience one controls himself and the whole world. Such a high virtue is patience. <clears throat> we see it's something that, due to the uh, element of Kali Yuga, is being gradually destroyed. In the sense that things are very fast. <clears throat> People want results fast. <clears throat> but for something that is worthwhile or worthy, it takes time, it doesn't come immediately. <clears throat> you put a seed in the ground <clears throat> and you can't get a tree simply by planting the seed. You made the first effort, but then there is the cultivation of the plant through watering, picking out the weeds, and gradually, in due course of time, the beautiful plant will come. So patience is, a, is an element. Now patience doesn't mean you don't do anything. Patience means you continue to be enthusiastic and you continue to be determined. But at the same time, you're patient. <laughs> Now, patience is a feminine quality. Krishna mentions the, the feminine qualities in the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Fame, fortune, patience. What else? There's a few more he mentions. These are all feminine qualities. And we see, in general, those who inhabit bodies that are female have a general tendency to be a little bit more patient than men. <laughs> it's true. <clears throat> because it's just the nature of the body they have that patience re is required even more so. That's also a problem. It's just the biological nature. And Prabhupada uses the example. And he uses this example over and over again. A woman gets married and she's eager to have a child but simply by getting married and the husband is there, she, she knows that in the future the child will be, but not immediately. So patience is required, and then in due course of time results manifest. So patience is a great virtue. <clears throat> um, the first verse, what we mentioned this morning, by practicing patience you can be successful in this. This is very much connected to patience. The word vagams means urges. Urges of the mind, urges of the body, urges of the you know genitals, belly, tongue, anger, speech. These are urges. Learning patience helps to control these urges like that. Especially the four central vagams like that. So... A person who is patient is sober, not moved by happiness and distress. That's the word, the word dira is a quality that means sober. Happiness comes, distress comes. Krishna mentions in the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita that one who is not 
moved by happiness and distress is fixed in spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Happiness comes, distress comes. One is fixed and not deterred or moved. Yeah. When someone has Prabhupada, you know, uh, what was it? What is the what is the what is the meaning of the word dear or sober? Prabhupada said, not moved by the rascal scientists. <laughs> or the politicians, the plan makers, or whoever else or is in authority in this world. They make their speeches, they make their pro programs based on their speeches. We are not influenced or moved by such people. <laughs> like that. That's what it means to be dear. Uh, on, moved by external circumstances. So patience is a very high quality, but it has to be, it's, if you're patient without enthusiastic enthusiasm, you won't get anywhere. If you're enthusiasm without patience, then you're like a short fuse. You know, you go and then you, you know, you just go for a while and then you quit, and then you go for a while and you quit. Patient is you're really not doing anything. You're just waiting for you know the divine uh, element to manifest out of the sky someday. <laughs> Arjuna was on the chariot with Krishna, and Krishna didn't. Prabhupada says Krishna didn't tell him you sleep and I'll fight. No, he said you fight. I'm here, but still you have to fight. So your success is not simply my presence, but by your my by your fighting, my mercy becomes manifest. So there's a famous, famous story in the Chaitanya Charitamrita which illustrates patience. What is that story? Lord Chaitanya was in the uh, house of Srivas Pandit, and it was the Mahaprakash Leela, it's mentioned in Chaitanya Bhagavat, where all the devotees were there. And Lord Chaitanya revealed himself as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He came to Srivasa's throne. He took all the shalagrams off the throne. He sat on the throne himself, put the shalagrams on his lap, and said, Now worship me. Whoa! The devotees were in ecstasy. It was such a happy occasion. And then they began the RT, and, and now, of course, the first they offered the, the, the bay, they bathed the Lord with pots of water from the Gaga, and they offered nice boga to the Lord, everything they had, and then they performed the RT. After everything was done, the Lord was extremely pleased, and he said, now take a benediction for me. Every one of you, each one of you ask whatever you want, I will fulfill. <laughs> wow. Imagine that. So if Krishna tells you, just ask for anything. Think about it. What would you ask for? <laughs> but the devotees were asking, my dear Lord, please make my father a devotee. My Lord, make my friend a devotee. My Lord, give me pure devotion to you. Everyone was either asking for Pure devotion or asking or praying for someone else's benefit. So finally, one devotee said to my dear Lord, please give Mukunda, Mukunda was Lord Chaitanya's kirtan singer, very dear to Lord Chaitanya, please give him the uh, love of God. And uh, Lord Chaitanya became quite silent and then he became quite disturbed. He said, Mukunda? He's an offender. <laughs> wow. He's, the devotees were shocked. Then the Lord said, Mukunda is like a person who comes, offers nice flowers at your feet, and then takes a stick and beats you on the head. <laughs> he does nice service to me, but then in the evening he goes out and he hears from everybody and anybody. And he's hearing all kinds of all other philosophies. Therefore, I reject Mukunda. 
In fact, not only do I reject him, I don't ever want to see him again. <laughs> Whoa. Now, Mukunda was in earshot of what was happening, and he was listening. And then when he heard that, he just started to cry. <laughs> the devotees realized that Mukunda was in trouble. They had to do something to save Mukunda. They were concerned about their fellow devotees. So they pleaded with the Lord, please give him another chance. The Lord said, all right, he can come and see me after 10 million births. After 10 million births, he can have my association again. When Mukunda heard that, he became happy and started to dance on the side, away from everybody. He was dancing, I will see, I will see, only 10 million births, only 10 million births, I will see, I will see, and he was in ecstasy. He became so enthusiastic that Lord Chaitanya noticed <laughs> And then he said to the devotees, all right, bring him immediately. <laughs> Patience. <laughs> he was willing to wait for that long to get the mercy again. And because he was willing, he got it immediately. Because he was patient, he got it immediately. So patience really attracts the attention of the Lord. But patience means you don't slacken in your determination or in your enthusiasm. But at the same time, what is that verse? Aparana guchi suraname ruchi. Right? Do you know that? Aparana guchi suraname ruchi. When will that day be mine? When all my offenses ceasing, the taste for the holy name increases. When, oh when, oh when will that day be mine? Bhakti Vinodak or praise like that. All right, so we're chanting. We're still infected with offenses and we don't have a taste. But still, we go on. We don't give up. We remain patient. Eager, but patient. In the very early beginning days of the Hare Krishna movement in New York City, there was one devotee, his name was Hayagriva Prabhu. And after one year of being with Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, <laughs> he was a, he had a very deep, deep voice, and he was a professor of English, and very erudite. Prabhupada, I have been a devotee in one year. I'm not getting love of God. <laughs> Prabhupada said, oh, one year. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> How long have you been in the material world? <laughs> and so Prabhupada indicated that, you know, well, we should have to be patient. <laughs> yeah. Patience. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I got initiated, now everything comes, right? No. Prabhupada said, initiation means what? Beginning. Before initiation, you're practicing to begin. You're getting a feel of the water, and when you get initiation, then you actually are starting to enter into the, the waters of bhakti. Before then, you're testing the waters, just getting a feel of it. And so you can get familiar with it and then get attracted to it. And then once we begin, then, so it's a process. It's a process. It can take you many lifetimes, or Prabhupada said it can take you one moment. Generally, it takes one or two lifetimes to go back to Godhead. Prabhupada said two, but you can do it in one in some cases. <laughs> well, really don't, we really don't know. Well, of course, we may have some indication if I was a devotee in my last life. And many of you were. Many of you who are here now were devotees in your last life. Some of you may, have, may not be, some of you are. But devotees come, either by the causeless mercy of Mahaprabhu, 
or because of previous lives and, and again getting connected with the process. But whether we begin now or we have already begun, still we can do it in this lifetime. Yeah. But patience is there, it has to be there. So patience is, uh, some of the symptoms of patience is don't eat too much, don't eat too little. <laughs> Moderate. Practice fasting. Uh, subduing the six urges. Lust. How do you offer, subdue lust? Offer it in Krishna's service. Work hard for Krishna. Anger. Direct anger against the envious non-devotee atheist. Greed. Get greedy to hear the glories of the Lord. Illusion. Without Krishna, I'm in illusion. <laughs> Dovetailing illusion. Uh, Madha, madness, or sing the glories of the Lord, like that. So these are ways of subduing those anarthas or those six enemies of the mind and senses like that. So patience. Patience is, uh, it's the symptom is, uh, one of the verses is, one who, one who doesn't eat too much or eat too little, sleep too much or doesn't sleep in, enough, cannot perform the yoga system. So moderation is the process. Krishna says in the next verse, one who is moderate, or he uses the word temperate, which means moderate, in eating, sleeping, working, and recreation can overcome all material desire, uh, material miseries, miseries, by performing the yoga system like that. So moderation is a symptom, a symptom of patience like that. Being moderate in your act, in your basic day-to-day -day life like that. Not too much, not too little. Any questions on patience? Such an important principle. One verse, Visayam Vinivartante, Niharasya Dehinam, Raso Varjam, Raso Pyaspyat, Param Disvan Vinivartante. The embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, though the taste for sense objects still remains. Stopping such engagement by experiencing a higher taste, one is fixed in consciousness like that. Mm -hmm. The, uh, what was that? The, uh, the 11th canto, the Avanti Brahman, right? He was so rich, he had everything, and then, but he was cruel, and he lost everything. And then he became detached from everything, and then everyone came to him and said, they saw him as a dirty old beggar, a rowdy person started to dishonor and insult him. Some people would take away his sannyas rod and some, some his water pot and begging bowl. Some took his deer skin, some would, his chanting beads, and would, some would steal his torn ragged clothing. Displaying these things before him, they would pretend to offer them back and then they would hide them again. They were teasing him. They hated him because before that he was just a heavy, nasty materialist. Now he became a sannyasi. When he was sitting on the bank of the river about to partake of the food that he had collected by begging, some sinful rascals would come and pass urine on it. And then they would spit on his head. They would criticize and insult him, saying, this man is just a hypocrite and a cheat. He makes a business of religion simply because he lost all his wealth and his family threw him out. Some would ridicule him by saying, just see this greatly powerful sage. He is as steadfast as the Himalayan mountains. By practicing of silence, he strives for his goal with great determination, just like a duck. Others would pass foul air upon him, and sometimes others would bind the twice-born Brahma in chains and keep him captive like a pet animal. He never did anything to resist. The Brahman understood that all his sufferings from other living beings were from the higher forces of nature and from his own body, they were unavoidable, being allotted to him by province. He accepted everything as being his destined. And then that famous verse, etam sayastya paramatmanishtam, 
Ayasitam Parat Brahar Maharsha Vihi Aham Tirishami Dharat Vaparam Tamomakundagri Nasevayavan. He spoke this verse. Lord Chaitanya repeated it many times. I shall cross over the insurmountable ocean of nations, being firmly fixed in the service of the lotus feet of the, the Lord. This was approved by previous acharyas who were fixed in devotion to the Lord. Paramatma, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So he accepted everything as his due karma or providence and became fixed in devotional service. That's patience. <laughs> Any questions on patience? Yes, uh, Subhadra, Hare Krishna. Well, if you're humble, you're also patient. If you're humble, you're also patient. Humble is the principle of our existence that we are very small and we are also prone to be overwhelmed by material energy. So humility is the principle of taking shelter of Krishna in each and every circumstance and seeing oneself as being small never looking for praise or being uh, inspired by, you know, position. And patience is part of that, because if you're not patient, you can't be humble. Just because it'll destroy your practice of humility. And if you're patient, it doesn't really mean you're completely humble, although there is qualities of humility within patience. But humility is also a feature of knowledge, where patience is more like a, a feature of the will, like that. So they're similar, but and they're inter interactive, but there is a a difference. So if you're humble, you're definitely patient. <laughs> If you're truly humble, you're definitely patient. If you're not, if you're not, if you're impatient, how could you say you're humble? Because humility means to depend on Krishna's mercy. And therefore, Krishna's mercy may come or not come, but still, one. The, we have the example of the Chitaka bird. The Chitaka bird is a bird that flies up to the clouds and it drinks water directly from the clouds. It will not go anywhere else to get water. Although water may be on the ground, it won't take it and it only takes water directly from the clouds. And the Acharyas explained that Chitaka bird may be near the cloud and the cloud may also strike lightning and scare the bird, but the bird will never go away because the bird is fixed on only getting water from the cloud. So a devotee is like that, only wants the mercy of the Lord and not accepts the mercy of the materialist. Doesn't go away. That's a symptom of patience also. Does that help? <laughs> Thank you. Some other suvitri? Yes. No. <laughs> no. That would be foolish. No, you have to protect your Krishna consciousness and you also have to protect those who have come to you for shelter. And so if you act by not acting, you're not humble. There's that, uh, there's that famous, famous story. There was one famous nonviolent person. And he said, by no means will I become violent. I practice nonviolence in any and all circumstances. 
So he became somewhat popular from that. One day one reporter said to him, my dear sir, I know that you have a daughter, and if I come to violate your daughter, will you try to stop me? <laughs> Challenging question to his... To the, he answered by saying, under no circumstances will I become violent. He said again, if anyone comes to do, do some harm to your daughter, will you try to stop them physically? He said, under no circumstances will I become violent. The reporter said, my dear sir, you are violent. <laughs> because you fail to protect those who, re who require protection. That's another form of violence. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we have to act on the principles of Krishna consciousness. Like that. Hmm. So that's, you know. When the devotees were being attacked by the deprogrammers, this is a whole story, a his, big history, the devotees were fighting back. <laughs> I mean, they would attack us physically in the airports and other places, and devotees were fighting back physically. It was, it was just like a war. And they got the message that you can't push around the, the Hare Krishnas. <laughs> you know, they've, if we would just said, you know, peace, uh, love, uh, you know, you would have just kept going, you know. But, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, Strike back or let them know that you can't do this. <laughs> like that. Some of these interesting stories in that regard. So for Krishna and for Krishna's devotees, we have to, sometimes we have to act strongly. But for ourselves, we're humble. Uh, Sajimata? Hmm. Oh, so a lot of devotees weren't here. I'll read that quote again, those of you who missed it. He says, I'll read it again, By patience one controls himself and the whole world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as soon as you become patient, everything else follows. <laughs> There's nothing to attain. <laughs> A whole world. In other words, one, when you're patient, you're pretty much in control of everything. <laughs> Be patient also means doesn't mean detachment. Detachment is part of patience, but patience means that one is willing simply to wait for the mercy of the Lord. That's all. And the Lord is controlling the whole world anyway. So by waiting for the mercy of the Lord, you also become empowered. A patient person is a, a person who is trustworthy. In other words, nothing can affect you. The world can't affect you if you're patient. And patient means enthusiasm, determination, and patience, not just patience. <laughs> it's all three. Susanna? You have, to, you have to see the circumstances. And then, if you're not sure, get advice. Sometimes you may act, and sometimes you may act if, not act. And then, when you do act, how do you act? <laughs> like sometimes, for instance, people pray, they come to us, they say, can you pray for my health, my mother's health, my father's health, my father's sick, he's dying, pray for health. What do we pray? We don't say, my dear Lord, give him health. We say, my dear Lord, if you simply want to, 
please make that person healthy. That means we're leaving it up to Krishna and not interfering with his will, which may be different than our prayer, you know. Okay? Follow? All right, so we just got halfway through this third verse now. We just reached the halfway point. I'm sorry, it's kind of taking a little long here. So the next one is tat tat karma pravartana, which is the activities of pure devotional service. Rupa Goswami explains that there are 64 items that are mentioned in the nectar of devotion, and five of them are potent. What are the five potent forms of devotional service? Someone name one. Chanting the holy names. Number two. Srimad Bhagavatam. Three. Worshipping the deity. Four. Residing in a holy place. Huh? Five. Association of devotees. These are called the five most potent forms of devotional service and even a gross neophyte, a person who just comes in contact with Krishna consciousness, if they practice this, they can feel ecstatic sim symptoms. These are powerful. So tat tat karma pravartana means to practice the regulative principles, follow the rules and regulations, and uh, follow the instructions of the spiritual master, like that. I'm going a little fast. And Lord, I'll read one verse which kind of sums up. When you read the 64 regulative principles, you just fall off your chair, right? <laughs> In fact, if you can get through all 64, that's good. <laughs> They're really, really quite, you know, they need, each one needs an explanation. But Lord, uh, Lord Krishna himself sums up the 64 in, into 15. Would you like to hear the 15? Okay. It's a verse, this is a good verse. It's from Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th Canto. 19th chapter, verses 20 to 24, these five verses. He says, <clears throat> Firm faith in the blissful narrations of my pastimes, constant chanting of my glories, unwavering attachment to ceremony wor ceremonial worship of me, that's three, praising me through beautiful hymns, great respect for my devotional service, offering obeisances with the entire body, how important obeisances is, performing first-class worship of my devotees, consciousness of me and all living entities, offering of all ordinary bodily activities in my devotional service, use of words to describe my qualities, offering the mind to me, Rejection of all material desires. Giving up wealth for my devotional service. Renouncing material sense gratification and happiness. Performing all desirable activities such as charity, sacrifice, chanting, vows, and austerities with the purpose of achieving me. These constitute actual religious principles by which those human beings who have actually surrendered themselves to me automatically develop love for me. What other purpose or goal could remain for my devotee? So Krishna sums up the 64 in these 15 activities like that. Okay. So anything, any questions on tat tat karma pravartana? Performing the activities of devotional service. Hearing, chanting the glories of the Lord. Yes? Same tendencies, uh, different tendencies. Different. Yeah, different modes. Um, how, do, how does that work? How do the modes affect their, their progress? And is it possible that someone may be in a, in a lower mode, but they have more, they're more spiritually, they're moving forward, they're advancing more than someone who's in a higher mode? Yeah, that's possible. 
because of their practice, enthusiasm, and devotional service. <clears throat> and Prabhupada would say, you know, when he would go back to India, he would point to his Western de devotees and say, they're making, you know, they're all pure devotees. They're making nice advancement. He would wanted to show that the Indians, you know, even though they were born in India and had connection with Krishna consciousness, they had really not taken seriously the process. So he was showing that the Western devotees are an example for what you should be. <laughs> Although they may have been, been in a lower mode before, like that. Yeah, so that was an example, like that, so. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, that's an easy one. This is the tough one. Don't worry, lunch is coming. Okay, I think. <laughs> I hope. All right. Okay, the next one is... <clears throat> this is number five. Sangha Tiaga, renouncing unfavorable associations. There's two kinds of association, unfavorable association. One is called non-devotees and one is called the opposite sex. <clears throat> So one should avoid carefully non-devotees and one should not associate with the opposite sex <clears throat> unless it is required in accordance with one's ashram. But then that, ashram, that uh, association is restricted according to regulative principles also. Any questions on that? Non-devotee association, associating with the opposite sex in, in the wrong way. <clears throat> or in outside of the regulative principles. Yes, Mataji? Affection for. <laughs> yeah. Physical proximity doesn't not necessarily mean association. It means if you develop a similar mentality or affection for that person. Yeah, that's the actual understanding. Yeah. You have to go to work, but that doesn't mean you have to associate with those persons who are non-devotees and accept their mindset. If you do, then you're going to go down. Yes, uh, Sri Devi? Um, what is the definition of a non-devotee? One who is, <clears throat> well, there's different kinds of non-devotees. There's different kinds of non-devotees. I think... Bhuta Bhavana will cover that in detail in his next, there is, what is it, what is that heading? Uh, there's one section, different kind of non-devotees, the Dharma Dwajis, what else, the, 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 the faults and the renunciates, the, the, the materialists, the, uh, what is it, mm -hmm. opposite sex, what, there, there's how many different kinds? different kinds of non-devotees. Uh, when they have different kinds of characteristics, but they're not practicing spiritual life, <clears throat> and they're interested in material activities only. That's a non-devotee. Well, Lord Chaitanya was asked, <clears throat> who is actually a devotee, or how can you attend, attend, uh, tell who is a devotee? He said something really shocking. He said, anyone who chants the holy name of the Lord just once, I consider them, him to be a devotee. So he gave a very liberal definition of a devotee. So anyone who chants the holy name can be respected, but due to association, you may not associate with that person. You associate only with those persons who are engaged in devotional service. You may respect someone who has some tendency for Krishna consciousness, but doesn't engage in devotional service. In other words, favorable people. But still, they're engaged in material activities. The non-devotees, their goal is to enjoy material life. Whether they're karmis, Gyanis or yogis, they're all non-devotees. Even the yogis are non-devotees because their desire is to ma manipulate the material energy and become powerful through that manip manipulation. 
The Gyanis want to enjoy the subtle mind through philosophical speculation and renunciation. And the Karmis simply want to enjoy gross sense gratification. These are three kinds of non-devotees. Okay, like that. 